this next segment is for people who are just exploring the idea of adopting a plant-based diet. So many of the exam room viewers and listeners are long-term, long-haul vegans. But this is for those who are entering this new year wanting to clean up their health. And so here now with 10 things you need to know about going vegan is the one and only dietitian. I call her the fiber queen, Lee Crosby. Lee, welcome back to the exam room. Great to be here. Thank you, Chuck. I'm so thrilled that you are here because, you know, we're talking to new vegans today. We're drawing in a new audience. We want to help everybody get started on this plant-based diet. You've come up with 10 things that people need to know before they make that switch. So you ready to dive in? Let's do this. What is the first thing people need to know about going vegan? Okay. Well, there are so many things, but the, just to sort of take an, an intro, not all vegan is actually created equal. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So vegan is awesome. Don't get me wrong. It is an awesome, and I like to think of it as an awesome first step. It has definite health benefits all by itself, right? You're cutting out red and processed meat. That's lowering your risk of colon cancer or breast cancer. There's no salmonella contaminating your kitchen. I remember that being something that was actually a huge relief to me. When I switched over, I was like, I don't have to sweat about the biohazard pathogens. Like, creeping in the little corners of my kitchen. That's lovely, right? Again, you're, you're going to get the dairy out of your glass and off your plate and reduce prostate cancer risk and possibly also ovarian and breast cancer risk. So you've got a lot of benefits for health. You are doing something clearly that's good for the planet and for animals as well. And then vegans, we have plenty of data showing that on the population level, they tend to have a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, a lower risk of heart disease, of certain cancers. That's just going vegan. But that is step one. Mm -hmm. There are other steps in this process. Do you know the next step per chance? Well, going vegan is a good first step, but there are very many layers, as you said, of, of going vegan. So once you've gone vegan, that next step to me would be maybe whole food, plant-based. Excellent. Also known as vegan plus. So <laughs> you're going to take out the, you've already gotten the animal products off your plate. Next, you're going to avoid or minimize added oils, right? And that's where the whole food comes in because what is oil? It's, it's a refined food, right? You've stripped away all the minerals and the fiber and the protein and the good stuff. And it's just basically pure fat. So you're going to get those out of the way and you're going to get the rest of the sort of empty junky foods to keep them to a minimum. We're talking things like white flour and white sugar. Basically, you're eliminating the other, the standard American diet foods that manage to like slip in under the radar on a vegan diet. Because you get rid of a lot of standard, the sad standard American diet foods, you get rid of a lot of those when you go vegan in the first place. This just kind of shoes the rest of them out the door. Like, scoot, we don't, we don't need you here anymore. So it really focuses on foods that are high in vitamins, in minerals, in protective phytochemicals, and the foods that are rich in all those things. We're talking fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, also known as beans and lentils and split peas, and then a modest amount of nuts and seeds. And this is just a side note on what a phytochemical actually is, because I've had this question. And phytochemicals are really this just broad group of substances that are found in whole plants. There's no set requirement for them like there is for vitamins or minerals, but they have proven or suggested benefits for health. And these are things like resveratrol and red grapes that may help heart health or those purple blue anthocyanins that are found in berries or the flavanols in cocoa, which you know are my favorite. They can help with brain function. Thank goodness. So that's whole food plant based. And there's actually one step further here. And this is the one that really gets people healthy when they are in need of that for them. And that is a low fat whole food plant based diet or a low fat vegan diet. Vegan so plus. Super vegan plus. Is that what we're calling it that is one? Super, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you understand. That is super vegan plus. And what that is going to do is also, in addition to cutting out the animal products and the sort of like junky or refined stuff, you're also going to minimize or eliminate, generally minimize those higher fat plant foods. So things like nuts and avocado, which are very tasty and do have some nutrients and fiber, but if you're trying to lose weight or if you are trying to lower your blood sugar, they can kind of get in the way. So mm -hmm. this is this is the next, this is what we use, for example, in the clinic when we have someone who comes in with, um, who is overweight or obese and really needs to lose that weight because their blood sugar is starting to go up and their cholesterol is going up and they really need to, you know, get that 
under control to bring that blood sugar back down. This is what we use in sort of a therapeutic way to get people where they need to go. So it can be highly effective. Yeah, and that is the perfect segue to the second thing that people need to know about going vegan. Yeah, and that is, this is a good positive side effect. You may lose weight. And the more you do a low fat, I know, the more you do the low fat whole food plant-based diet, you will almost be guaranteed to lose some weight. So if you're focusing on fruits, veggies, whole grains, beans, those pounds, they are just, they're just going to come off because you're getting the fiber that you need to feel full without all the extra added calories that your body doesn't really count, right? It's not counting the soda calories, meat and butter. Like there's no fiber in that. Your body's not really checking that off. It's like, oh, I feel good and full. I've gotten what I need. It's not, it's like, just keep feeding me. So I do wanna make the point that the vast majority of Americans do not get enough fiber. I'm the fiber queen, so I have to stump for fiber. So your brain is literally programmed for high fiber foods. You need that fiber to feel full. When you are deficient of fiber because you are consuming foods that are stripped of fiber or animal foods which have zero fiber, the brain literally, again, it literally has trouble knowing when we're full. It doesn't know when to stop. So we actually stop eating too late after we've eaten more than our body actually wants and needs. And those high fiber plant foods are really what helps to fix that. Mm -hmm. So again, you can sort of plan for weight loss, for some people who actually don't wanna lose weight, and there are certainly people who are, they don't need to lose weight, that's actually when I will have people, A, eat more, and then eat more of those higher fat, whole plant foods like nuts, seeds, and avocado, just to keep them from losing weight. Because otherwise the odds are good that it's gonna start coming off. And I can talk about this from experience um, in, in that, uh, it just, Think about it in this term, if this is why you are going vegan, this is why you're doing it because you want to lose weight. Well, think about the foods that you are eating now. Think about all of the trips through the drive through and the amount of fat and the amount of calories that you're taking in with every meal. At my heaviest, I was eating 10,000 calories a day. Don't expect that you're there. But what I'm saying is you're still going to eat as much food, if not more, on this vegan, this plant-based diet but the fat intake, the caloric intake is going to be so much less that really you, you're not going to have a choice. That waistline is going to shrink it down and your body's going to be fueled with healthy, nutritious food. So all of the other things that you need to work on, whether it be high blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera, we may get into that a little bit later, that's going to improve as well with that shrinking waistline. So really simple. You're not going to go hungry. And that is something that scares the bejeebers out of so many people when they go on diets. It's like, I can do this for the short term. I can be hungry for just a little bit. But with the plant-based diet, you will never go hungry. No, hunger does not look good on anybody. It is not, it's not, it's not good. So, and that was actually a big deal for me because like everyone else, you know, in college and these things, like I had dieted and it was miserable. I was cranky the whole time. I was just like counting every calorie and wanting to make sure when I transitioned to a lower fat plant-based diet, I wasn't hungry and I just lost weight. Like it was great. I was like, what, where has this been my whole life? Like, why has no one told me about this? Why did I have to do all this extensive research to find it? So it's one of the reasons that I'm a dietitian now is to help get the word out that, wow, this exists and it's here and it's great. I don't want to say it's super easy initially because it can be a little hard. So we're going to talk about some of the things that'll make that a little simpler, but wow, right? Where, where has this been? You will not be hungry. If you're hungry, eat more food. Amen to that. And what, what other way of eating do you know where that is the mantra? If you're hungry, eat. Hello, winner, yeah. winner. When, uh, when clients come in, I ask them, oh gosh, well, you, have you been hungry? And never has anyone said I've been hungry. No, it's, it's impossible. It does not happen. Given the volume of food that you'll be eating and the fiber that <laughs> yep. it contains, it's just impossible. Pretty um, much. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to number three. If you're overweight, obesity obviously is an epidemic, but we also see so many other people with the chronic illnesses related to obesity, diabetes Lee, being a big one. It is rampant. It is unfortunate because it is related to the increased risk for all kinds of bad things that you don't want. I mean, amputations and not losing your eyesight, it, dialysis, these are not things that anyone wants. And diabetes raises the risk for all that. And yet it's very stealthy, right? It starts with a slow creep. 
upward in blood sugar. And honestly, by the time that starts, the pancreas has been struggling for years. So by the time someone gets to full-blown diabetes, their body is really crying out for help. So what we do often find is that uh, people, when they switch to a low-fat plant-based diet, they start losing weight and that helps all by itself. But also just changing the fuel, even though it's higher in carbohydrate, actually helps get at the underlying root cause for type 2 diabetes. So just a, can we do a super quick physiology lesson? By all means. Okay, just a tiny bit. So what actually causes type 2 diabetes? Any thoughts? What, would the, what do you think the average person would say? What causes I, diabetes? I, I would say sugar would be the average person's answer. Yeah, yeah. The average person's like, oh, sugar, so I'm going to stop eating sugar. But it turns out that really the root, one of the main root causes for type 2 diabetes isn't sugar. It's too much fat in our muscle cells. But why? I know. Why does that matter? And I know some of our listeners have heard this, but it I think it bears repeating. So muscle cells use most of the carbs that we take in, which break down to sugar. So muscle cells are the sink for that, right? Think about it. When an athlete has a big competition the next day, they carb load because the muscles are going to fuel up on that and build up their glycogen stores and they're going to go take over the world. So muscle cells are using those carbs, that sugar we take in. However, if those muscle cells are full of fat, which can happen if someone is overweight or obese. It can happen in people that are sort of at like upper healthy weight if they store their fat more in their muscle cells than someone else does. The muscle cells say we're full. They take in even a healthy carbohydrate like a sweet potato and the muscle cells are like, no room in the end. That blood sugar is staying out in the blood. It's not getting in here, which is hence your blood sugar starts to rise, right? So over time, you get pre-diabetes and diabetes, but the actual problem is still that fat and the muscle cells. Going vegan obviously can help you lose weight, and that will help clean out those muscle cells all by itself. But fun fact, and we don't, we still don't know the mechanism, but vegans on average actually store less fat inside their muscle cells, which may be one of the reasons that vegans, they also tend to be a healthier body weight, but they are at lower risk of type 2 diabetes. So again, shifting over to a plant-based diet, especially one that's low in fat, actually has a tendency to make people's blood sugar go a little bit, a little haywire in that first week or so. And then it tends to head down. And I want to say that can happen pretty quickly. So if you are taking medications that lower blood sugar and that have a risk of low blood sugar, I would like you to talk to your doctor, let them know that you are changing your diet and keep an eye on your blood sugar. Check it. If you start running lower than is normal for you, or you have a low, golly gosh, treat it. But call your doctor because they may need to adjust your medications. Don't do that on your own. Call your doctor. No. And and I'll tell you, talking about uh, the high fat diet really being the culprit behind this type two diabetes epidemic. Um, think about also a lot of the foods that do have high uh, levels of sugar. It's not just a lot of sugar in there. Cakes loaded with fat, ice cream oh, yeah. loaded with fat, Snickers bars, loaded with fat and so on and so forth. So you really do get that double dose. So when you take a second to sit back and think about what it was, Lee, that you just explained, it really does seem to make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Yeah. So many people say, oh, I'm cutting out carbs. And what they mean is I'm cutting out cake and donuts. And I'm like, you know, that's a lot of fat, right? In terms of percent of calories, we could be looking at even amounts or actually more in terms of the fat, the calories coming from fat. So yeah, you are absolutely correct. All right. So now I want to go back to what it was you were talking about earlier with the vegan plus and the super vegan plus diet. I think that the further up the super scale you go, the <laughs> less, thank you, the less, super sodium, scale, I like that. The, the, the less sodium you're going to have in the diet. And I think that that then would play perfectly into the fourth thing that people need to know. And that is blood pressure. So sodium is important. If you when if and when you change to a vegan diet, you can expect that your blood pressure is likely to go down. Um, why is that happening? Like you said, you're likely going to be eating less sodium, particularly if you are climbing the super scale, <laughs> <laughs> climbing up the super scale and eating more whole foods and lower in fat. Um, what's also going to drive that is that you are likely going to be losing weight and losing weight drops blood pressure, you're also going to be eating foods that are naturally really rich in potassium. And that also all by itself can help lower blood pressure, which is all dandy. Most people need their blood pressure a little lower and none of that by itself will push your blood pressure too low unless you are also taking a medicine that drops your blood pressure on purpose. So if you combine a diet that gets your blood pressure naturally to a healthy level, and then you pile on a drug that drops your blood pressure <laughs> to what can be below a healthy level, you could um, end up 
yourself standing up and dropping over. So not, you know, just passing out because your blood, your blood pressure drops too low. So again, if you have high blood pressure or you're on medication for blood pressure, you want to be monitoring your blood pressure, letting your doctor know. And if you start running lower than what is typical for you, then, or heavens, if you have like an episode of low blood pressure, please contact your healthcare provider because they will probably want to adjust your medicine. Again, not something to do on your own. Just give them a call. That's what they're there for. And important also, why don't we go ahead and lump in another thing here that is often far too high in a lot of people. Uh, and that is something that you will only find in a diet that is chock full of dairy and meat. What is that? That is, so we want to bring down cholesterol and going plant-based is a very simple, highly proven, well-supported way to lower your cholesterol. So total cholesterol and that bad LDL cholesterol, those are almost guaranteed to decrease when you switch on to a plant-based diet. So that's a nice side effect. Yeah, real talk. When I was overweight, um, I was put on blood pressure medication when I was still in high school. It was something oh. like 180, 190, over 90 or 100. I mean, yeah, it, was, no. it was up there, right? But my cholesterol was also way up there. And so both of those plummeted after um, they began to drop as I lost weight. But then when I transitioned over to a plant-based diet completely, that's when they really dropped. And my cholesterol, uh, one of uh, the doctors upstairs at the Barnard Medical Center, he actually met measured it. And he said, man, this is one of the three lowest cholesterol numbers I have ever seen in my entire life. And it was just by going plant-based, you know? And so that, that made my, my, my ticker feel good, you know? Literally so, and figuratively. Indeed. All right. Number five, I'm just going to put this ball completely in your court, step back and then giggle like a five-year-old. Because really at the end of the day, I mean, maybe 10 or 12, I don't know. <laughs> Your BMs will be a breeze when you change over to a plant-based diet. It is just easier to go when you are vegan. We're talking like reliable, happy bowel movements. So have you all ever seen that ad that was on for the Squatty Potty? Are you familiar with the Squatty Potty? I have no idea what you're talking about, but it sounds epic. <laughs> <laughs> so unrelated to going vegan, there's this lovely contraption called the Squatty Potty that tucks by your toilet and it gets your feet a little bit higher. So it's sort of like, it basically kind of puts you in a squat position without actually having to squat. Yeah, yeah, we're going there. <laughs> Hence why it's called a Squatty Potty. I also affectionately call it a poop stoop. So it basically just gets your body in optimal pooping position. That is not the point of this. They had an ad. Are we going to cut this part out? Oh, they had absolutely an not. <laughs> They had an ad, I think it was on like YouTube or something a few years back that had a, un <laughs> a unicorn <laughs> that pooped rainbow soft surf. What? <laughs> this is a squatty body. I highly recommend that you Google it. It is very entertaining and had like millions of views, but that's how easy and comfortable it will be when you are on a plant-based diet and it comes to going number two. Okay. I, sure I, don't, cut that out, I, I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> Unicorns and rainbow bowel movements. I don't know. It will not be rainbow. Unless you oh eat beets, then that's a maybe. Oh, my gosh. Well. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe we'll just. Yeah, moving on. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I, I don't know where to go from there. Like, I feel like we should just <laughs> stop at five. I mean, that is a showstopper. Oh, my gosh. Google it. Just All Google right. It. All right. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I, I worry a little bit if someone Googles pooping unicorn who just Google squatty potty. Mm, that'd be a heck of a meme. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's put our professional hats back on now. If we must. And uh, go back. Oh, boy. To some uh, to some honestly uh, serious real talk here. Your your number six here is really good. This is important because I as great as a plant based diet is, it is not a panacea. It is not going to solve every problem in your life. It's not going to pay down your credit card debt. It's not going to give you, you know, the a whole new, it's not going to like completely make you over. It's going to make you healthier. You're going to feel better. But again, it's not going to fix every problem you have. And I do run into people who are disappointed because they, yeah, they have a little more energy and they've lost some weight, but it's not just the end all be all fix for everything. And it's not, it's a change along with things like, exercising and stress management through meditation and all these things. And even they aren't going to totally fix your life. It's just going to make life better to live. Yeah. Um, so I just want people to, yes, all these benefits are not only possible, but supported in the research literature. But at the same time, it, it is not likely to fix every problem you have.
Right. And yeah. if you go back and you, you listen to archived episodes of the exam room, you'll always hear us use the term lowers your risk. It doesn't completely exactly. eliminate it. It's all about lowering your risk. Yes. But it's kind of like playing the lottery, right? So right now you have a one in 300 million chance of winning, right? But if you adopt a plant-based diet and you are hoping to lose weight, lower your blood pressure, lower your cholesterol, reverse diabetes even, right? So you're going to be in a far better position than one out of 300 million. I mean, your odds are like, I mean, you're, you're better than 50-50 in a lot of cases. I mean, way better than 50-50 in a lot of cases, I would say. But there's no silver bullet here. There's no magic bullet that's going to be a cure-all. Correct. And I'll hear that sometimes someone will say, oh, well, I was vegan and I got a cancer diagnosis. Like, what's that about? And I'm like, well, you reduce your risk, like you said, but you don't eliminate it. If a vegan diet were a cure for cancer, I think, you know, that would be <laughs> probably, wow, we just solved one of the world's problems. It sure can reduce your risk though. Right. And having, you know, a risk for having a recurrence for some folks. But at the same time, it is not you know, in and of itself going to fix everything, but it sure does help with a lot of things. It does. And I also, I don't want people hearing that to let that be the wind going out of their sails. Oh, um, I no. think that so often when we're looking at making this enormous change in our life, that when we hear that what could be just even the smallest bucket of cold water that could be poured on us, we use that as the stopping point, as the excuse not to continue because not continuing is just the easier route to take. But I'm telling you, this is not an excuse not to try. It's not an ex it should not be the excuse why you don't try it. Correct. And I will also say that continuing with what you're doing now may feel easy short term, but long term, it sure isn't. Looking yeah. at what people are up against when you look at what happens in terms of the the long term, but even the short term results of what people are eating. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can just see this for myself in terms of. I've dealt with fibrocystic breast disease. So one of the reasons I came to plant-based eating was because of an increased risk for breast cancer. And if I start going off the wagon, I mean, I stick with the vegan thing, but when I start to kind of go into the junkier stuff, I get pain right away. <laughs> like my body doesn't wait. It's like, oh no, lady, mm -mm, let's get back <laughs> to healthy eating. So it can give you some very immediate benefits too. So yeah. it's not like you have to wait 10 years to see that I lowered my risk for diabetes. It's like, oh, you can get some benefits right now. It's just is it going to fix absolutely everything right this second? No, it's not. But it helps so much that it is absolutely worth whatever effort it takes. 100%. Could not have said it better myself. We're up to number seven. What do you have for us? Oh, I love this. Okay, this is promising. This is hope. This is beans. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Yeah, laugh it up. But beans, if, if, if people take nothing else away from this about plant-based eating, I want to make sure they're eating beans. And here's why. Okay, everyone worries about protein on a plant-based diet. You don't need to worry about protein on a plant-based diet. One of the reasons is because you're going to be eating beans. They are protein powerhouses. They're packed with it, minus all the saturated fat and cholesterol that you get in animal products. More important and closer to my heart, they are fiber mega stars, like big time. So again, the average American is eating 15 grams of fiber all day long. Like that's it. One cup of black beans all by itself has 15 grams of fiber. So you have lunch and you've already knocked out the fiber that most of America has eaten all day long. So the amount of fiber, again, is one of the features of them. They help keep you full because they have that combo of protein and fiber, but also they feed the good bacteria in your gut. And that is huge because those bacteria, have you ever heard of the gut brain axis? Oh yeah, that is a fascinating thing. That's a vegan 2.0 or 3.0. Uh, okay. we're, we're, we got newbies here, so let's not scare them off, but it is okay. a fascinating We're not going to scare them off too much, but let, suffice it to say that when you feed the bacteria in your gut good things, and you want bacteria in your gut, you want the healthy ones, they tell your brain good things. So this, and those good things are things like, hey, we're full and we're not going to be hungry for a while more. It basically helps in terms of satiety. So I feel full. I'm not, you know, sitting around and having the kinds of cravings I had. Also for blood sugar. When you eat beans the same day your blood sugar improves, your body has an easier time controlling your blood sugar the day after you eat them because of the effects on the microbiome or the mm. gut flora. So really and truly you want to eat beans. They're also linked with weight loss itself. So please, please include beans in your diet. And are they really good for your heart? They are, but you know, the more you eat. I know, which brings <laughs> us to number eight. 
Okay. And so this, now this is, this is something that most people will experience a little bit. And that's a good thing. It's, it's what you expect because you're eating all these fruits and veggies and whole grains and beans. And that's awesome. And we know who else is benefiting, right? Mm, 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 The good guys in your gut, all those trillions of bacteria that are in there hanging out. When they first get a lot of fiber, the ones that digest fiber are stupid doped, right? This is not what they're used to. And they are having a flipping field day. They are thrilled, right? And at the same time, they're also kicking the bad guys, right? The bad guys are getting, they're getting booted off the island. The good guys are throwing a party and you're going to know this because you're going to experience gas. So eventually that will settle down and you will feel better than ever. But for that first few weeks, and we're talking anywhere from like two weeks to two months, Gas can be an issue, particularly if you go all in all at once on a whole food plant-based diet. Right. So this is one of those times where I'd say, you know, if you are uninitiated, so to speak, just let's just take it easy. Let's just, you know, if you're changing a lot of other things, maybe you don't dive right into whole grain pasta. Maybe you start with white pasta. Like if you're having beans, well, actually, let's talk. Let's talk tips. Can well, we talk- yeah. And see, now this is something that I wish that I had when I first uh, adopted the plant-based diet because I did go all in. I just pushed all of my chips right, right to the middle of the table and went all in with this thing. And for the first two, maybe two and a half weeks, I mean, there was significant bloating and gas and abdominal uh discomfort to the point where, I mean, it was, it was painful. And I was doing sit-ups in the middle of the night in the kitchen, like trying to get some gas to come. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it was, it was serious. So I would love for you to be able to share some tips to help alleviate a lot of those symptoms for people. Okay. Yeah. Learn from Chuck. Don't do that. <laughs> so you got, like I said, you want to ease in a take a week or two and sort of transition. It really does make a difference. Cause what you can do is start to just shift the balance of power in your gut to the good guys instead of just like you know fire and fury and napalming we don't want to do that so beans and lentils and split peas start with half cup a day or less and you can even break it up you could do a quarter cup at lunch and a quarter cup at dinner most people don't get gas eating a half cup per day even at the beginning Um, and again you're going to give yourself the bacteria that you need to comfortably digest those things and you're going to do it at a reasonable pace if you do that. And then you can start working your way up to a cup or day or more. But again, just take, use your body's cues and take those, you know, just listen to what your body has to tell you, literally in this case. Um, when you're having beans, drain and rinse them, right? So drain the liquid out of the can, then rinse them off that liquid that they're cooked in. Um, or if you cook them yourself, do the same. It contains carbohydrates you can't digest, which then go down to your large intestine, which is where the bacteria hang out. And on top of all the other fiber that's in there can lead to gas. So we don't want to do that. Cooking on a stove top and make sure you got them in a rolling boil for a couple of minutes first, or even better yet, in a pressure cooker until they're really nice and soft, makes them easier to digest as well. And soaking, if you're cooking them at home, which you don't need to, you can absolutely do canned beans. That's great. If you're cooking at home and you're soaking them, make sure you dump out that soak water and then cook them in fresh water. Because again, that soak water is going to have some indigestible carbohydrates that can cause gas. And then just soaking the beans themselves can help transform some of those substances that can cause gas into non-gas causing substances. So those are just a few tips. I've I've always got a couple more because this is a topic near and dear to my heart. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, and and really quickly before we move on to number 9, I also know that one of the things that you and I have talked about and I had no idea was even could be an issue was eating beans and fruit at the same time initially. So this is more anecdotal. I don't know that we have studies on this, but particularly fruits that are higher in some of these um, FODMAP chemicals that are um, that can give some people gas issues. If you eat those at the same time as beans, again, maybe this is TMI, but I'll just say anecdotally that can lead to gas. So like maybe if you're going to have an apple and you're going to have beans, you might have the apple as a snack later and have the beans at lunch. Again, this is just something that I have noticed. And when I've shared with people, some people have good results from it. For some people, it doesn't really make a difference, but good to know. I do want to mention one other thing with fiber. When you increase your fiber intake, make sure you're drinking plenty of water because if you eat a lot of fiber, but you don't give any water in there to hydrate it, sometimes that can actually cause constipation in some people. And that is not what anyone is going for. And constipation can also mean gas. So we don't want to do that. Drink Mm. plenty of water. 
You ain't lying. You yeah. ain't lying. So with the ninth tip, I want you to answer this question. Is it possible to get all of the nutrients you need 100% just by eating the plant-based diet? Or might you need some help from a supplement? Well, it, it's a little tricky. My answer is you will need a supplement. You will need supplemental vitamin B12. It is not optional. Some people will say, well, you could do a fortified, which is code for supplemented, you know, nutritional yeast or milks and add it up to the, you know, daily value for vitamin B12. My answer is don't rely on that. This is the simplest thing in the world. It's pennies a day. Take a vitamin B12 supplement. It is not found in plant-based foods. It's found in animal-based foods. It's not actually made by the animals. It's made by the bacteria that live in their guts and some of it soaks in. So just take a vitamin B12 supplement. You really only need, I believe it is 2.4 micrograms per day. That's not very much, but once your body really only absorbs about half of that amount at any one time efficiently, and then it absorbs just a tiny fraction of what's left. So if you just want to supplement once a day, you actually need to take way more than 2.4 micrograms to absorb 2.4 micrograms. So the minimum we'll tell people in terms of supplementing, unless there's some reason for them not to, for most people, it's 100 micrograms per day if they're under 65. General guidelines, again, if they're over 65, will actually say 500 micrograms a day because you often will not absorb it as well as you age. And people on certain medications don't absorb it as well. So the sort of, I think the a good general rule is to get your B12 levels first supplement and second, get your B12 levels tested in the first, you know, sometime within that first year of going vegan to make sure you're on target. You might be getting more than you need. You might be getting enough. Iodine is an overlooked nutrient that I know uh, should be discussed here as well. It is. So it's one that is, I think, again, like you said, overlooked. So people think, well, people probably don't think a lot about iodine, but they should. It's important. You need it for thyroid health. There's also some evidence that is needed for breast health. Um, so there are a couple of different reasons that you want to have it. And where most Americans are getting it right now is actually from dairy products, but not because there's magically natural iodine in dairy products. Most of the iodine in dairy products is coming from the disinfectants that they use on cattle's udders and trace amounts of it get in your milk. Blah, and you don't need much iodine. You just need, you just need trace amounts. So that's actually where Americans are now getting the majority of their iodine where they used to get it was from iodized salt. So the problem here is that your processed foods, which have tons of salt, almost never have iodized salt. And the salts that are trendy right now, I don't know. Chuck, what are the trendy salts? Do you know? Pink Himalayan sea salt or, or a pink Himalayan salt, uh, sea salt, obviously yes. Celtic sea salt. I mean, there's yes. so many. Isn't there black salt now? There's so many different kinds. I think Celtic doubles the price. Yeah. Oh, right here. <laughs> <laughs> pink quadruples it. So those are all very fancy and they make your pantry look, I don't know, she, she, but bougie. Yes. Your pantry will be so bougie, but you are not going to get the iodine you need from the salts. There is, I think one brand of sea salt that actually adds iodine, but really you just want to buy the salt that your grandma used. Don't add any more salt than you already use. The goal is not to add more salt. It's just to change out whatever salt you use for iodized salt. If you don't like salt, sea vegetables, like those little nori crunchy sheets of sea snacks, or if you do like a vegan sushi, that wrapper on the outside is actually a good source of iodine too. So there's a workaround. Um, sea vegetables are in some cases even too high, but in iodine, but those little nori sheets, two thumbs up in terms of amount. And the final tip, this one to a lot of people, I think is as exciting as losing weight. And it's actually perhaps the most surprising because when you think about a vegan diet, you probably think the opposite is going to occur. But what is number 10? Well, you know how I said a vegan diet can't help you pay down your credit card debt? That's actually not true <laughs> as I'm thinking about this. So a vegan diet can save you money. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to have to buy some kind of like weird you know, I don't know, no chicken, chicken and like acai berries grown in like compost, composted like lotus flowers or something. <laughs> like, I don't even know. You do not. Beans and rice, oatmeal, bananas, spaghetti and tomato sauce, sweet potatoes and baked beans. These are cheap. These are some of the cheapest foods you can buy. And they're also like rocket fuel. They are so good for you. In season, produce can be inexpensive. In January, it can be pretty pricey, right? Frozen fruits and veggies are awesome. They're easy. My grocery bills actually have tended to go down. I'm trying to think. It's been a while since I've eaten animal products, but I can remember, I mean, meat's expensive. Even the fact, even 
with all the government subsidies and everything, meat is expensive. Yep. So you are going to be eating cheaper if you are eating plant foods. So yeah, it can save you some do re mi. No question about it. And we put that to the test uh, a while back. You and I went to a boutique grocery store yes. in, in yes. Washington, D.C., where the prices would be high anyway. Yeah. Filled yeah. up a grocery cart with enough food for two people for an entire week and mm -hmm. spent only a, a skosh over $40. Yeah, it was just around $40, a little bit more than $40. It's yeah, and healthy. Amazing. And with all the, you know, with the vitamins and the minerals and the fruits and the veggies, all the things that you need for good health. Fiber Queen, Lee Crosby, thank you so very much. 10 tips, 10 things you need to know about going vegan. You're the best. Thank you so much. Sometimes, sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> Today you were. Today you were. Thanks, Chuck. It was great to be here. If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.